Hey, good morning, Last in Line Nation. Thank you for joining us for another set of episodes for the month of December, uh, building our story around kingdom business, building our story around just faith uh, in our everyday interaction, balancing what that looks like, balancing the relationships. And I couldn't be more excited about how we're starting off December. Um, no pun intended on this one, but our leadoff hitter here is uh, very much a powerhouse guy. I, I um, had the pleasure of introducing myself to him over email, as we're doing a lot now. Um, read a devotional of his one morning, uh, started really digging into that, and it just kind of captivated me. And the way he writes and his heart behind it, I had to reach out to him. And knowing his background, it was a little bit, uh, you know, a little intimidating at first because I will introduce this guy. Pat Combs is a former major league pitcher. And those of you who know me, we're a baseball family. So that stood out to me. That was a big um, hot button for me. So, so it's really an honor to, to have him on. But I'm going to read a little bit of Pat's background because so many of these accomplishments and things he's involved in are just really um, powerful and and really kind of shed light on his journey and and we'll put some context around some of the things Pat shares today. So Pat Combs, um, he actually does live in the Dallas area, um, but Pat, you know, he has a passion for people and people, you know, growing people and coaching and just engaging. And he's a big relationship guy. And I will say, Pat. Um, has extensive experience and background in baseball. Like I said, he played at Baylor University here in Texas, eight seasons uh, in the major leagues. And for those of you that don't know, that is a almost an impossible feat in itself. There's so many people that, that want to do that. And for him to say he actually made it to the show for eight seasons is huge. It's, it's just mind-boggling to a lot of us that know how hard that is. Um, played with the Phillies and the Brewers. Um, from 1988 to 1996, was a member of the U.S. Olympic baseball team in 1988, which awesome. That was that's a cool thing to to be a part of. I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit about some of this. Um, even so, he is a a voice now that he doesn't play anymore. He's a voice for Fox Sports, um, the networks for eight years. He's done that. I guess going on nine now, um, but covers Big Twelve baseball, college baseball. So I watch a lot of that, and I'm sure I've heard Pat before on there and that broadcast. Um, 11 years with Morgan Stanley. And I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of giving you high, high levels of this background because there's so much good stuff. Um, 11 years with Morgan Stanley and uh, returned to Team Analytics, I believe, uh, which he'll, he'll kind of let me know the, the ins and outs of that, but he's been there for 19 years consulting and that kind of thing. So a lot of financial background with Pat. Um, currently, Pat serves on boards for several nonprofits, uh, including FCA. He's the chairman of a company called Unlimited Potential. Also serves on the board of trustees for East Texas Baptist University. Um, is an active member in the CEO Forum Spiritual Leadership Institute. Um, his wife, Christina, and three sons, Carson, Connor, and Casey. Um, so they all live in South Lake, Texas. And Pat is currently actively involved in, in ministry, um, active in his church. But um, most recently, I will say, as of this year, am I right? Uh, released a book. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wrote his first book. So did I actually, we, we were like months apart from doing that, which is cool. This book's called more than the score. Um, and it talks about, and I'll just read what it says, but this is a must read for any coach or parent of a youth athlete. And I would even say anybody because I've read pieces of the content and, and I would say it's, it's meant for a lot of people. Um, he takes on the cultural shift in youth sports from the win at all cost mindset to teaching virtue, character, and life skills. And Pat, welcome to the show. Oh man, John, it's it's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, super excited. I'm just uh, thankful uh, that you've got a show like this that reaches men and, and families and uh, to make a difference. So it's an honor to be with you. 
That's great. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I didn't do that near the justice, but I know there's a lot in your background to be proud of. Is there anything I left out maybe that, that you're, you know, you kind of hang up there as one of your prouder moments in, in any of your background that you can share? Well, I mean, there's, uh, you know, as far as the professional world, you know, being able to move into different uh, places where I feel God has called me to, to work has, has been, uh, has been awesome. You know, just trying to hear his voice in terms of where my assignments should be. I, I guess I'm one of those guys that, that never really got focused on any one thing for a long time. <laughs> you know, I did, yeah. got a financial background and we, we did start a company uh, after Morgan Stanley, my son and I now uh, run Combs Capital Partners. So it's a, uh, an active wealth management company and he runs the day to day and is doing a tremendous job on that. But uh, yeah, I think, it, you know, it all boils down to me, John, the way I think you, you, uh, you set it up. It's, it's, for me, it's about relationships. It's about people uh, serving them well, loving them well, mm -hmm. uh, just doing what, what God has designed for us to do. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful that, that uh, I had a number of great mentors and, uh, you know, spiritual leaders that came into my life and spoke truth and mm -hmm. uh, thankful I wasn't too arrogant not to listen at times. So, yeah. uh, but the other, the only other thing I think you left off was I became a father-in-law back uh, a year ago, October oh, okay. uh, to Sarah Rose Summers. Uh, Sarah and Connor got married. I, I was able to do the wedding and uh, honored to do oh, that. Oh, wow. Wow. And, That's awesome. and, uh, <clears throat> and we're, we're anxious for grandkids. We're, we're, we understand we're getting a grand dog here in December, but I'm, I'm yeah, not, not the same level as, as getting grandkids, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Sarah's a, a beautiful young lady and um, her and Connor met and started dating and it was just a, a great relationship. She's the former Miss USA from 2018. And just a quick story on that is mm -hmm. um, when we were counseling with them as they were starting their relationship and just hearing both of them say that they wanted to commit themselves to purity and uh, to do this, do the relationship right. And uh, even though it was long distance at times, yeah, uh, they really committed themselves to, to trying to walk with God do, even during their dating years. So that was uh, just an honor, honor and pleasure to marry them about a year ago. That is a, uh, you know, I would say it's a lost concept sometimes. And to be able to pull that off, I think is says a lot about their character, their spirituality, and just kind of their desire to make this start out the right way. And I think that's really, that's impactful for, for listeners because, they're, you know, we have a wide, wide range of, of audience, I think, for this show. And I think a lot of different people can relate to a lot of different things. And I think that's a good addition that you, that you threw in there because it is, it's a hard thing and it's a lost concept sometimes. Um, but yeah, you know, so to, to let the audience know for this, this month, we're going to talk about what I call fuel. And we're going to go acronym overload today. And my audience will know that that, that about me is that all of our episodes are acronyms that break down to different subcomponents, if you will. So this, ep this month called FUEL, and I like to call that Faith Unites Exceptional Leaders. And we're going to talk about how as leaders with a faith background um, and, and a faith drive, really, how does that, how can we incorporate, how can we unite in a world full of division? How can we as believers sort of lead by example of how unity looks, of how uh, the journey of walking out a, a, a realistic faith of loving people, not beating people over the head with religion, if you will, um, because I think part of that causes division. So we're going to talk about how we can unite people, not just believers, but how we can just get our arms around people in general and, and really lead by example. And so what I'm going to call this one, and, and really I had no intent when I thought of this, uh, having a, a former major league pitcher on first, but this is called turning up the heat. So the heat being hope, encouragement, accountability, and transformation. So we're turning up the hope, we're turning up the encouragement, accountability, and transformation. So we're going to go in and dive, dive into these a little further, but so... Pat, we're going to start with hope. Um, you know, in a world, you know, you don't have to, unless you've been in a cave for eight or nine months, you don't have to look far to see that we are struggling with this concept. There is probably a shift into more hopelessness 
with certain people than there is hope. Um, as believers, we know the end game, right? We know from an eternal perspective, we know what hope should be. Now, every day walking that out with our circumstances and different things coming at us, we to sustain that on a 24-hour regular basis is challenging. Give me your take just to, from a general standpoint, and we'll dive into some questions, but give me your take just on hope and, and how today it's so vital. Yeah, John, I think, uh, gosh, that's a foundational question for anybody uh, to have to answer for themselves. And, and you said it. I mean, it, if you don't have uh, a belief and a trust in, in Jesus as your Savior, and you're, you're not sure about your eternal destination, then that in and of, it of itself is hopelessness. And uh, you, you have no end other than separation from God for eternity. And that, mm. to me, that is the foundation for where we start with hope. Either you, you know Jesus, you, you're following him, you're a Christ follower, or you don't. And um, to me, that's, that's the basis. Now, we want to take it down to more of a, of a secular uh, viewpoint in terms of where we are now in, in society. Man, I, I think, John, what a, what a crazy, interesting time for us to be living in. But what an incredible opportunity for us to meet up with those who have lost hope or are battling hopelessness and need to know the love of Jesus in the gospel. So to me, it's, it's a, I think there's no greater opportunity that, that God has ever put us in on the earth uh, as, as followers of him than to spread that message of hope uh, through his word. And so that, that's where I start. And I, I, I've often thought to myself as we've gone through the, this COVID time and, and you, you, course are inundated with all the negative news you know you, you turn the news on it's just nothing but people yelling at each other or you know mm -hmm. death and destruction and you you think gosh um, is this all there is and for those who don't know God um, it is that that's all they've got that this life is all they've got so yeah that that's where I think the, the hopelessness has spread so I, I just want to reframe that and say as as followers of him uh, what a great opportunity we have uh, to get out of our houses, put our masks on, or what are we going to do and go talk about Jesus? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's good because really it can't start anywhere else. Um, because just like anything else, hope requires a foundation um, for, for you to build on that. You know, you can't start, um, you just can't start building without a foundation. So, um, you know, hope, today and I try to I try to think from other people's perspective and what people are grabbing on to um, you know not to get into a, a real um, a religious conversation as far as why we think certain things are happening but uh, from our spirituality standpoint what would you say to someone who maybe is a new Christian and they are finding it difficult. They're sort of straddling that fence, right, if you will, of they knew what their old life, so many years of their old life, and, and now they've, they've, let's say they've given their life to Christ, and they're trying to really find their way spiritually, but yet all the circumstances point to discouragement and those kinds of things. What, what's one thing you would say to that new Christian? Yeah. Uh, you know, John, I, I was – I think I referenced it early, but I'm so thankful that early in my walk, I was discipled by, uh, in fact, it was, I came to Christ through a Jewish believer, um, a pastor in Clearwater, Florida, named Steve Kreloff, who, uh, when I uh, trusted Christ for the first time, he walked that out with me. <clears throat> so for the next six weeks in spring training in 1989, uh, as I was, it was my first year with the Phillies, and uh, just walking that out on a daily basis with him going through the old navigator study guides, uh, mm. that set the foundation for me as a, as a follower of Christ. And so I would tell a new believer uh, exactly what Steve told me, <clears throat> you know, over 30 years ago, uh, take your commitment to God serious enough to develop your spiritual disciplines that when you get up in the morning, the first thing we ought to do is, is hit our knees in prayer, be thankful, connect with God, uh, get into his word, start to, to learn the knowledge of, of God and who he is and, and what he wants for your life. <clears throat> to me, there's no greater sense of hope that can be established in a person's life than getting connected with the God of this universe who loves you and cares for you deeply and wants to walk with you and have that relationship daily. And to me, that's the separator between 
a, a Christian who, who is full with, of hope and joy in those that are struggling in their faith. That, that, those disciplines really, I think, are, in essence, the, uh, the great separator between those who get it and those who are struggling. That's so good. Uh, you know, and as you're talking, I'm thinking to know the Father, you got to be near the Father. And, and so I, I feel like in any, even in the, any situation, to know somebody better, you've got to be close to them for a long period of time and, and build consistency. And personally, as a Christian, uh, early on, and I would say years early on, I did not practice many of those disciplines. And I did feel like there was maybe something that I was missing. You know, I was still a Christian, right? But the relationship was, maybe not where it could be because of my, my part of it, you know, and we want to say God isn't drawing near to us, but what's the word say? If we draw near to him, he will. And so we have to take that step. And so then fast forward to the last couple of years, I really started practicing that on a regular basis of starting my day. Like you said, there's, it's night and day. It's night and day. The relationship, the relationship and the connection that you feel. Yeah. So. Amen, John. Yeah. You really start to hear from him when you're abiding. And when I say hear, it, it's not, may not be the verbal voice, but you start mm -hmm. to hear from him through his word, through prayer, uh, through serving others. And that's, uh, to me, there is that, 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 that is the foundation uh, for, for growth and, and really developing a, a stronger foundation of hope yeah. in the future. Yeah. God's going to take you through uh, anything that comes about in your life and you, yeah. you feel a sense of security and trust and uh, a deep sense that, that he's got you no matter what happens. Yeah. Do you have any examples before we shift into the next uh, segment of this, any examples where you kind of felt like there was a hopeless situation that maybe your perspective or maybe some steps you took that kind of changed your mindset and, and it, make, it became more hopeful than hopeless. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I've been through a couple of, uh, you know, really tough circumstances in business especially making that transition out of sport into business and um, you know, relationships with even fellow believers that I thought were, were solid and, and uh, we were moving things in the right direction. And then, you know, invariably as, as things happen in business, uh, we had a tough circumstance that, that arose and, and it was, uh, it was early in my walk uh, with Christ. So not, I wasn't a baby Christian, but I was within my first, you know, seven, eight years of, of walking with God. And, and when, that person, that individual turned against me. Um, boy, it was, it was tough, John. It was mm -hmm. really uh, gut wrenching to, to try to understand that from a spiritual perspective, not just a business perspective that, that hurt in and of itself, but it was, mm -hmm. it was way deeper on the spiritual side of how could this uh, person who calls himself a, a believer, uh, a follower of Christ, you know, betray another Christian and, and do it in a way where it was hurtful. And he was almost intentionally trying to cause pain mm. for me and my family. So, um, and I think a lot of us have stories like that. Mm. So what do we do with that? You know, and, and again, thankfully, as I pointed out, I've got people in my life I've surrounded myself with that. Um, it, it's almost like, the, you know, Ephesians five that tells us to put on that armor of God, right. You know, to establish that shield of faith. Um, but I've got, other believers in my life who I, I've leaned into uh, for difficult times, and they have walked with me through those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the biggest lesson I learned through that, John, was that um, we, we stay steadfast and focused on God and his word. And again, he will make those things right. He'll, he'll walk us through those things. It may not be how we envision it to be right, but God will make it right. And, um, and we just have to simply honor him in that. And you know, there's a, a ton of scripture about vengeance belongs to him and, and he'll, you know, he'll, he'll take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. But uh, there was probably a, a chance I could have, I could have sued this person, won a lot of money in court. And I was counseled not to do that. And we got to the backside of that, that issue three or four years later, I was so thankful I didn't do what the world was telling me to do. And I, I really stuck to what I felt God was telling me to do. And through some great counsel, uh, was able to get through that and keep uh, the relationships around that intact. Uh, now the person who betrayed me has not ever come back around in my life, but, but the people around that understood what was going on, those relationships were made whole and, and, and good. And that's, that to me was the, the blessing of, of, of walking with God through that. 
That's a win. Yeah, that's a win for sure. And we're going to dive more into some of that uh, when we get, talk about accountability. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, for anybody listening to that, what I heard you say was it's important <clears throat> whenever the storms start to kind of come and try to knock you around. It's important that that foundation, again, we go back to that. You had the foundation and then you also had people around you, that support system that those people that you trusted from a, from a like-minded standpoint, because we can also get some bad counsel too. Right. And so it was good that you knew and discernment was a part of that, knowing which people to listen to. So if the audience is listening, like you really have to build that, that faith based support system around you and, and know who you can go to. So let's transition into encouragement because I know hope and encouragement kind of go hand in hand and, and uh, dive a little deeper because you know, when I think about that, I, I know that there are gifts in the Bible. And, and really, I feel like encouragement, like it says, is one of those gift of encouragement, gift of leadership, teaching, those kinds of kinds of things. And I feel like, you know, I feel like God has given me that gift of encouragement because I've just had so many people tell me how I do that. And, and I don't do it consciously, really. You know, sometimes I do, but sometimes it just kind of comes out of me. And it sounds like you have a lot of similar traits. And that was one of the reasons I wrote that book called Last in Line Leadership, talking about servant leadership. And I really felt like during the COVID situation, as we're watching social media and hearing the news and everything is just so dark, I just felt like if I have a voice, I want to use it for good. I want to use it to encourage. And I think as we, you know, this whole segment's called, you know, Faith Uniting Exceptional Leaders. And as we do that, I think we all have one voice that we need to kind of share from an encouraging standpoint. So um, talk about your gift of encouragement, because I feel like that is one that you do well. And um, the, the discouragement around us, how can we persevere when everything around us kind of looks like it doesn't want to hear what we have to say, if that makes sense? No, it makes total sense. And it's, uh, I think we live in a world that, that, lacks great encouragers at times. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I've written a lot about this. Um, it, there's a, a chapter in my book that really asks of a parent or a coach. And I think it's relevant for, for this answer yeah. is that mm -hmm. are, are we an asset or are we a liability mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, walking with our kids, teaching our kids, mentoring them, discipling them. Uh, and, you know, if you want to take an example of uh, how we do it as a parent, you know, after every game, and I oftentimes coach my sons, but there were times when, when I was on the sidelines. My oldest son played hockey. I didn't know squat about hockey. So, yeah. uh, you know, he was a hockey player. My other two were, were baseball, football. But uh, they will tell you after every game, uh, the first words out of my mouth were words of encouragement. And it, it oftentimes started like this, John. I'm, I'm so proud of you, son. You know, and, and we would talk specifically about something that happened during the game or maybe something they said to a teammate to lift their spirit or whatever it was that they did, I wanted them to know, first of all, that I was proud. Uh, then we would get into some of the details about, you know, what could you have done different or, you know, how could you have made a, a you know, a different play here or there? You know, we would get specific about things they could work on uh, to improve their performance, but it always came from the standpoint of encouraging them to be the best they could be, yeah. uh, to represent God in the best way they could uh, as teammates and really focus on, on building their character and their, their virtue. So, to me, that, <clears throat> that it really is the essence of what it is to be a, a great encourager and, and a great teacher, a great mentor. I mean, the question I always ask folks is, think about uh, the greatest teacher or mentor in your life. Mm -hmm. And what, first of all, what, what made them that way? You know, what, why did you come to trust them or believe that what they were telling you was, was truthful or helpful? And on almost every time I get the answer back, it was because they cared for me, they loved me, they, you know, they, I knew that there was a connection there. They, they cared about the relationship. It was always relational first. And then it was how they, you know, helped draw out the best in them in whatever they were doing. So to me, that, that is, is what encouragement is all about. It's about establishing trust and building that relationship, letting somebody know that you truly do care for them before you even get into any part of their business or what, what's going on in their lives. They, they, right. And folks have to know that we care for them. And that, that old saying about, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much we care, that really is true. Yeah, that is. It is. And it, it, it feels like 
I don't know, I, I guess on the surface, it feels like if we are created in the image of God and, uh, you know, not just believers, but, you know, folks in general, it should come naturally uh, because, you know, we, we, we were built by the best encourager, you know, of all time. So it should be in us. But it, just like everything else, it takes intentional actions to activate some of these gifts within us. I, I feel like we have to be intentional and, and our hearts got to be right, of course, um, to be able to walk out some of these. Otherwise, they just stay there and, and never get developed or, or utilized for the benefit of somebody else. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a, that's a great take on it. Um, you know, even believers. So uh have a a little bit of a challenge with some of this during what we're going through now um you know even believers are starting to feel discouraged i would say um even if we've been the best encourager for years what you know how would you what advice would you give to somebody that maybe feels like they're being a little bit steered by the circumstance in some of this situation with what they're good at, what they've always been good at has maybe stalled out right now in the last six to eight months because of what's going on around us. How would you maybe give them something tactical, strategic that they can maybe push through some of that from an encouraging standpoint? Yeah. Well, John, you said something earlier too that, um, and I I do believe this, that, that as a follower of Christ, you know, innately God has given us those, those gifts of encouragement and, you know, helping others to develop hope, but it all goes back to him, you know, so uh, I would say in the natural, um, there, there's a, a lot of folks I know that just struggle with that, and, you know, it, and I think a lot of it has to do with life experiences, you know, I've come across a lot of men who just had difficult relationships with their dad or, or their parents growing up, and, mm-hmm. and they, uh, that, that, that gift of encouragement or, or being an encourager uh, just doesn't, it's not expressed, right, so you're exactly right. You've got to be intentional about how to develop those skills. And, and so for me, it starts with prayer. If, if there's a gap in my life, you know, first of all, I got to know about it. So if, yeah. if I'm, if I'm too arrogant not to know about it and I'm not asking folks for feedback, I'm probably not getting it right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the gift of that is if you, if you've got some trusted relationships and I call truth tellers, ask them, you know, Hey, it, am I doing okay in this area? Are, are you getting enough from me in, in terms of encouragement? Um, my wife is, is awesome in this area. You know, her, uh, her ability to be critical is really high, which is actually a benefit for me. <laughs> At first in our marriage, it caused some friction, but I came to embrace that because she was so quick to tell me, uh, you know, the truth and she would not hold it back. And, and so she, uh, more than anybody else has shaped my life in a way that, um, I've gotten some great feedback. And, I, and when I get that, I'm able to do something with it. Because um, I asked her one time, there's a story in the book that, that talks about this, and, and it's kind of a, a fun story, but um, I've, I've got a mentor, a guy named Flip Flippin. In fact, I, I work for his company, Teamalytics. Um, Flip, uh, years ago, this was, this was 23 years ago, um, when I first started working with Flip, we were, we were driving on our way to an event he was speaking at. And um, I was probably three months into our relationship. So we didn't know each other that, that well. And I think Flip would be intentional about trying to develop relationships. So he said, hey, I've got a speaking event two hours away. Why don't you drive and we'll talk on the way out there. And so about probably 30 minutes into the conversation, um, he asked me how my marriage is doing. And I said, well, I said, Flip, that's kind of a personal question. And uh, he said, yeah, it is. So, so tell me on a one to 10, how, how is your marriage? And I'm trying to get out of it, John, any way I can. Like, well, well, Flip, we don't know each other that well. And, and that's, that's really personal. And this is, you know, that's kind of my wife's and I's business, right? <laughs> right. That's bold. That's bold, man. Yeah. <laughs> he would not let it go. Now, I know this is kind of going to drift into some accountability, but the setup for this is that yeah. uh, Flip would not let me out of it. And I finally said, okay, Flip, it's a nine and a half. I mean, our marriage is great. On a one to 10, it's, it's high, man. It's a nine and a half. And he's like, wow, that's that's fantastic. That's a, that sounds like a great marriage. It sounds like you guys are doing well. And I said, yeah, we're, we're, we're really doing great, Flip. <clears throat> so we drive down a little further, about 15 minutes later, actually I had my cell phone out as I was driving. And Flip picks up my phone and starts messing with my phone. I looked over, I said, Flip, what are you doing? He said, don't worry about it. Keep your eyes on the road. And 
And then he hits the button, puts the phone up to his ear. And I'm like, look, what are you doing? <clears throat> and he says, don't worry about it. And then it, on the other end of the phone is my wife. I hear her voice. And, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. You know where this is going. So Flip is like, <laughs> hey, Christina, it's Flip. Hey, everything's okay. Pat's with me. We're just driving to an event and uh, having a conversation about marriage. And I just asked him on a one to 10 how your marriage is going. And he said it was really high. Gave me a great score. I just want to ask you on a one to 10, how are things going? A four? Really? Well, tell me what's going on. <laughs> And I can hear all this going on in the background. You can kind of hear that voice. I'm like thinking, what is she doing, man? Well, she's a truth teller, so exactly. he's going to get the truth. So, <laughs> and, it, and it was like, at that moment, I'm thinking, does she realize what she's doing? This is my new boss. I'm, I'm in a, it's a leadership development company. I'm, she's just throwing me under the bus. I'm going to get fired today. I'm going to, you know, what were you thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're having this conversation. <clears throat> and, um, the really cool part was Flip hangs up and he, he says, well, um, did you hear the score she gave you? I said, Flip, I could pretty much hear everything. He said, yeah, four. Um, I said, Flip, I, I, I just can't believe you did that. And he goes, well, listen, son, uh, I'm not really caring a whole lot that it's a four today, but it's not going to be a four next Friday, is it? And I was like, oh, man. And he said, we got some work to do. And uh, I'm like, Flip, I, I, I just, I, I can't believe you did that. And he said, get over it, man. He goes, listen, he goes, I hired you to help grow other people. But if you're not the best husband and best father you can be at home, how is that going to help you with what we're doing together? And, uh, and from that moment on, it was, it was a, a turning point in my marriage. And I'll tell you the final part of that, John, was um, he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Every Friday at four o'clock, you're going to call my cell phone. And if I don't answer, you're going to text me a message and you're going to give me the score. And I said, okay, I can give you my score. He goes, no, no, no. I don't want your score. I want Christina's score on you, how you're doing that week. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. I said, Flip, this is not fair. He goes, okay, I'll make it fair. You can call Susan, my wife. You can call her every Friday and ask her how I'm doing. Okay. How about there that? You <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm like, man, this is crazy. But I, I tell you, John, wow. that, that was a turning point. And um, wow. I'll never forget getting home that night. And, um, man, I still get emotional because I think um, yeah. how important that was in my marriage. For the first time, somebody stepped up and was going to hold me accountable to how I was treating my wife. Yeah. And uh, I hugged her. I hugged her for a long time and said how yeah. thankful I was that she, she gave me that score. And I, I told her, I said, Christina, I've never been a four in anything. And I'm not going to be a four in my marriage for sure. So you can count on me growing and getting better. That's really good. And that's really good. I, um, man, that does help, help us segue into accountability too. But I will say if she hadn't been so honest, what would have happened? You know, and, and I'm thinking if she had have said, Oh yeah, we're about an eight or a nine, you know, where would this have gone? And so the fact that they say all that to say, as we lead into accountability, having those people that will give you a four when you need a four is crucial. Um, right. And I will say, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, accountability is one of those things that we as believers talk a lot about, right? <clears throat> excuse me. We, um, we, we talk about it being a crucial pillar in our faith in walking this out. But I wonder are we really, do we know, you know, tactically how to walk it out or are we too proud to really implement it sometimes? <clears throat> and so I think that's where the separation gap is. And that's what I kind of want to talk about a little bit when we talk about accountability is, is there in your mind, what is the gap? What is causing the gap from us having those truth tellers in our life and us being willing to, to get transparent and get authentic? Uh, with those people. So what, talk about that and where the gap might be. Yeah, John, it's, to me, it's, it's really simple. I mean, just having worked so many years in, in leadership development and especially with men, you know, it, it, the, the one word, it's very specific. It's pride. You know, it's, it's just a lack of humility. And it, look, I, when I first became a, a follower of Christ, um, I felt like God was calling me to live a life of perfection so that I could be a great representative for him. And, you know, you talk about being an ambassador for Christ and well, gosh, if that, if I'm an ambassador for Christ, I can't make mistakes. And I, you know, I, I certainly can't slip or, or, you know, say something that I shouldn't say or, I mean, so it's yeah. all that legalistic thinking that enters into our minds. And that, that to me just causes even our pride to swell even more. 
you know? And so mm-hmm. that is the battle for any of us, but especially those who follow Christ. And, uh, and if, if you're a believer and, and you think that God has called you to live a life of perfection, man, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Right. <laughs> I can right. just tell you that is not the expectation God has on your life. But I, I hear more and more from men that they, they, they don't want to be transparent in those ways because they feel like, uh, if the truth comes out, it's going to do damage to their testimony or damage to them as a leader. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're exactly right, John. We've got to surround ourselves with those truth tellers that are that are bold enough and honest enough to tell us exactly what they're seeing or feeling and not hold back and blow smoke up our skirts. They, they We've got to find those people. And if, if you have them, man, that is, you, you are so far ahead of the rest of the pack. Um, but then again, the, the second thing in that equation is you've got to be willing to ask for it. And for many years, I, I was, I wouldn't say I was afraid to ask for feedback. I just felt like I didn't need it. I'm like, man, I, I got life figured out pretty well here, you know, and I'm doing pretty good. I'm making a good living. I'm supporting my family. I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm trying to live like a follower every other day and do those Christian disciplines. And man, I'm, I mean, things are going good. And man, that, that's a, that's a false narrative as well. That, that can get you in a, in a trap. And uh, so I think that's, that's really the key to me is, is, uh, uh, praying through, uh, reading through the things that God teaches us about humility and, and walking it out and getting those truth tellers around us and, and asking for, for that feedback. And if, if you don't have a flip flipping in your life, man, go, go find one. Wow. That's true. You know, it, wow. That's good because for the people listening to this, that, and I think there's a lot of these people who are believers, like you said, who man, if my life's not a train wreck, I really don't need those accountability people around me. I really don't need to hand the mirror to somebody and have them hold it so that I can look into it. And that's what I equate that accountability person sometimes with is someone you trust enough to give the mirror to hold in your face. And I, I teach a class on Wednesday nights uh, at church virtually, of course, right now. And, and I spoke on this very thing Wednesday and um, you know, speaking to believers, and, and we don't have this all figured out. I mean, you know, to go back to your original statement of perfection and faith, and maybe is that the, the thing that's preventing folks from pursuing that in their life? And, and I'll be the first to just piggyback on what you said. That's not what, what being a believer is. You know, the cross tells you, and the grace of the cross tells you, it's not about perfection. So, you know, we've been given that great gift of redemption and forgiveness and, and, and certainly not a, a hall pass to just go out and do whatever we feel like and then come back to the, to the center, of course. But, but we do have that love and, and grace and understanding that God has for us that knows, just like we do with our kids, right? He's a father. We're parents. Our, our kids, we don't turn our back on, on them if they, if they spill the milk in the kitchen. So um, I'm glad you said that about perfection and that that's a lie. Um, because sometimes, you know, when we're walking this out, we don't have those people in our lives for those blind spots. We don't have those accountability people to, to be there in that blind spot for us because we don't always see when things are going good, right? We don't see that we're in need of anything. So Um, you know, why, why would you, so we kind of hit on some of this, but in light of the truth that maybe some accountability is unraveling a little bit in our Christian circles, let's just say, let's just make the acknowledgement that we're not as good as we could be in this area. Um, what is one thing within those spiritual disciplines, like you mentioned earlier, um, does God reveal kind of those areas to you when you go to him in prayer? For our audience, yeah, I, there's no doubt he does, and um, I mean, I, I get a sense of that every time I hit my knees, John. It's it's uh, you know, there, when I pray, I always start with thanksgiving. You know, I, yeah. I thank God for loving me, for caring for me, for saving me, because uh, I'm a I'm a sinner, you know, and right. so I just say, God, thank you for that, and then I I ask God to reveal, you know, what is it you, you want to do in my life? You know, how can I better serve you and and so it starts there. Um, and then as you walk it out, from my perspective, John, it's, it's uh, and the things that have worked in my experience yeah. is, is having regular interaction 
with, uh, you know, somebody in your life or maybe two or three people. And, and this, this goes back to, I'm going to take you back probably 20 years to uh, when I, where I learned this at first was with through Promise Keepers. Mm. And uh, when I first went to a Promise Keepers convention in Houston, um, that's what they talked about, you know, asking each other these difficult questions. And yeah. So I came up with a list of questions that I, I wanted my truth tellers to ask me. It, at first, it was a, on a weekly basis because there were some things I was struggling with. And then it became more kind of biweekly or even, even monthly. But I knew uh, those questions were going to be asked at some point, you know, in, in 30 days. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the last question on that card was, uh, having thought through any of these answers to your questions, have you lied to me? <laughs> I thought that was a great way to end it, you know. Wow. Uh, but that, to me, that, that really is, um, I think, the expectation that God has for us, especially as men, that we develop a relationship with, with a couple of guys in our lives that are so strong and not afraid to ask those difficult questions. And um, to me, that there's no greater place I've grown in my walk with God than through those, those uh, days with, with, my, with my truth teller. So I would say from a practical perspective that that's the best thing that's, that's worked for me, John, is, is having that in place. And I'll just, I think, highlight that story with, I've got a friend who works with a lot of mega church pastors. He, in fact, he counsels a lot of these guys. Mm. And the number one thing that those guys struggle with is loneliness. Mm. You know, they, they get to the top of their profession. They're, they're mega church guys. I mean, everybody in the world knows who they are. Mm. And uh, I mean, the stories that, that Lyle has told me with permission from these guys yeah. about the things they struggle with in their lives. I mean, it's, it, it, it would be shocking to you, but it's because of the isolation that they, that they get once they get to that level, you know, and they, there's just, Everybody around them is, is telling them all the things they want to hear. And, yeah. and so Lyle be, has become that truth teller in many instances for these, these mega church yeah. pastors. And I'm so thankful that God has, has created a guy like Lyle who's so strong and can give that tough, critical feedback to these guys because they're not wow. getting it anywhere else. So I would say even the people that we look up to in society, are, are, they're the same as us. They're, they're sinners. They're struggling with stuff. Yeah. And they got to have somebody to unload with and pray with and seek God's guidance through, uh, because that's it. It's, it's, it's just being lonely. Yeah, that is. And, and that's shocking to hear. And, but, but yet fairly, I mean, that makes a little bit of sense too, when you think about some of the things those, the pastors are going through, um, cause they don't, they're not overly approachable, or at least that's our perception as the congregation, right? That there's yeah. not a, and, and to invest in, it would just be exhausting for them to try to invest in so many people in those churches to, so yeah, I could see where that, that is a good point. Um, I, you know, it's, it's funny because I would say this is one of the areas I, I probably have the most need for growth in is personally. And I, and I do have a couple guys that I can reach out to, but it's, it's all about our choice on how real we want to get. Yeah. That's really going to determine the growth. It, you know, if we want to pour into it a little, just to kind of stay safe, then we're going to see, maybe just a little bit of growth, right? But if right. we want to incrementally get the ball down the court a little further in our spirituality, um, we've got to invest a little more. We've got to be a little more vulnerable and, and we've got to be willing to take some risks really in that. Um, but, but if you've identified those people, that's the key is if, if you're listening to this today, um, identifying those people, and it doesn't have to be 10 or 12. Right. I, I'm thinking if you can get one to start and, and make those small steps and identifying write down three and then really start to carve in questions to yourself around these people and say, OK, I can really trust this person. And you might come down to one that really is the one you can reach out to and make that phone call to and say, hey, will you would you mind if I called you once a week or can you call me once? Can we do this? you know, where we agree that you're going to either mentor me or you're going to be there as somebody that I check in with. <clears throat> I think that's huge because growth is part of this. And that's one real stable foundational pillar that will help with the growth. Yeah. So John, one more thing on that too. Yeah, that's, yeah. A <clears throat> that's a hugely important point because mm -hmm. look, I, when I started doing this, being transparent and unpacking my junk, uh, it was tough. It wasn't easy. Um, and there were things I didn't want my, my, my buddies to know about, you know, my, mm -hmm. there were things I was struggling with. I said, if, if I reveal yeah. this, it's, it's going to totally, you know, screw my whole witness up. And that's not true. That, in fact, that's exactly where, where Satan wants you. 
He wants yep. you thinking those thoughts to isolate you, to, to create even bigger issues down the road with you. You know, this, this is so revealing. I was with uh, John Stone Street, who runs the Colson Center, and they're really big on doing cultural studies. Mm -hmm. um, he told me a statistic that uh, boys 18 and younger, 18 and younger, 96% today in America are struggling with pornography. Yeah. So if, if you have that struggle or you think that that's something that nobody knows about or doesn't think is happening, I mean, that again, that's just a lie, right? I mean, yeah. most of us men are going to struggle in, in the areas of, of sex and, and porn and all the junk that, that we're inundated with. So don't think that, that, that people don't know that that's possibly going on in your life, right? Sure. The issue is, what are we going to do with it? Do we want to get stuck in those things? Because if you don't have somebody you can lean into and, and be totally honest with and have them walk with you through that, and look, they got to be trustworthy people too. You got to be careful who you pick, right? Sure. You got to sign that agreement that this is confidential. You yeah. guys are going to walk together. You're going to walk it out, but um, it doesn't go beyond anywhere it needs to go. And, yeah. and that to me is a, a big piece of that. But uh, we need that, John. We, us, us guys, we need that. We need those relationships in our lives. If we want to be all that God want, has designed us to be and called us to be, we've got to have that level of accountability and be willing to go there with, with other men. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for adding that because, I mean, those statistics don't lie, um, but the devil does, and he would love nothing more than to just keep that in darkness and keep that covered up. And, and there's a scripture that talks about <clears throat> confessing, you know, to other brothers, other believers, confessing and so that you may be healed. And, and uh, you know, I, I just, I'm a big believer in, in talking about it to somebody and then praying over it. And then I think you, you set the table for God to move in a big way in those situations. So the more we keep it dug, you know, kind of planted down here and pushed down, you know, it's limited on what you will see in that growth component. You'll, you're limited in what you're going to see and it's going to get toxic over time. Um, so those are, you know, we talk about turning up the heat. We've talked about hope. We've talked about encouragement, accountability, <clears throat> which <clears throat> I put a big capital A on the accountability because that's a huge thing I'm going to take away from this, but the last one's going to be transformation. So how do we, you know, we, we all want to make change. We all want to have impact. We all want to have purpose, right? So we, we're talking about how do we do our little portion in our little pocket of the world to help transform kind of what we're seeing out there into more of a reflection of what God intended. So how can we, and, and right here, yeah, you know, Pat's going to give us all the answers on how to transform and make the world a better place, right? He's got the magic formula. Uh, no, but, you know, let's talk about leadership, specifically, you know, a faith-based leadership. How does that help create positive change, or what ways does it help create a positive change? Yeah, John, I, I would say this, you know, transformation, I mean, accountability without transformation is just simply sharing junk, right? We, we've sure. got to be willing to, to, to make those changes when we get that feedback. So, to me, it's, it's once you establish that relationship, that trust, and you're, you're getting some good, honest feedback now, now the, the question is exactly right. What do we do with that? How do we make those changes? And change is tough, man. We've all been there, right? We're, uh, you know, January 1st is coming up. What are all those resolutions we're going to make, right? Sure. Going into 2021. Oh, yeah. Change, right? <laughs> so oh, yeah. Three weeks. <laughs> you know, so, um, look, some of us are, are more disciplined than others. You know, it, I'm, I'm really good at staying disciplined. I, I, I go to the gym every day at a certain hour. People know I shut my phone off. I'm, I'm just, that, that's my time to, to be with God, to relax and, and you know, hit, hit the weights and do my cardio and all that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I know that other guys struggle in those areas. And, um, but look, I still have to have uh, the feedback of what, what, do you, what do I need to change for next year? And here's, here's what it looks like. Um, here's how it's, it's worked for me. Here's how I do it with, with a number of people that I, I counsel and, and coach. Um, the first question I ask is, what do you need from me uh, to help you make that change? And invariably, they'll, they'll put down two or three things. And what I'm looking for, John, is I'm looking for specific behaviors that they can go to work on. You know, I, 
I don't want somebody to tell me, I just got to think differently in that area. I'm like, well, if that's what you're going to do, it's going to take you years to get changed because your, your thoughts are going to mess with you and you're going to forget yeah. and you're going to go backwards. So, but specifically, what are some behaviors you can change? And let's, let's start with, with that. Give me one or two things that you want to work on, you want to improve next year. And then my job as a coach is to come along weekly and just say, hey, how are we doing in that area? One to 10, right? That's it. And, um, and that's how we get uh, concentrated, intentional growth. Um, and look, for, for most of us, it, it's not wholesale changes. It's little tweaks. If we can get, if I can grow one or two or 3% in an area next year, that, and I'll, I'll give you one I'm, I'm working on. I want to uh, listen better next year. Mm. So in my conversations, I've written down uh, things that I want to do. I want to ask at least two or three questions before I start giving answers on something. Mm -hmm. That's a specific intentional behavioral change I'm going to make for next year. I'm already working on it now, but I'm just saying that that my metric is I'm going to start measuring that come January 1st. And I've got my truth teller. He knows what I'm working on. Yeah. And he's going to ask me, how are you doing with that? So to me, that... That's where transformation and change comes. And of course, it's, it's surrounded with prayer and asking the Lord, what, what is it in me that, that you know, he needs changed so that I can be a better servant for him? But uh, the practical part of that is those behaviors have to, have to be written down, talked about, measured, and then, and then continue to be intentional with. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for being you know, transparent about some of that stuff that you're working on, because I think people need to hear that, that, you know, um, and you talked about New Year's resolutions, you know, how, how many of, I know there's a statistic for everything, but, you know, it's got to be a pretty high percentage of those that probably fade or peter out by about March in most people. And, you know, right, or sooner. And so I think it's good that we, um, we write, I'm a big component, haven't always been, but uh, are a big proponent of writing things down so that you see them because, you know, to the point of the man that said, well, if, you know, if I just change my, how I think about this, well, you know, these habits we have didn't get, didn't happen overnight. Right. So it's going to take a process to change those and just thinking better thoughts while that's important is not going to change our behavior um, and sustain that. So I think writing those down is key, is key. Um, You know, being an example, like we talk about leadership, we talk about transformation, and we talk about kind of how we as believers in our, in our faith can help sort of spread the, the fire of change throughout our sphere of influence, our society, um, and stay small, you know, with our, it can be a small change, but, you know, we, we have to be that example. And, and I think that's, that's what, you know, I'm just, Part of why I started this YouTube channel was to get people involved that have different perspectives and experiences that can maybe someone can relate to what you're saying and they can walk this out and make these little changes. And then people see that in their life. And guess what? This thing starts to spread. And it's not about beating people over the head because we're all broken. We're all in need of growth. But I think if we all as leaders, because I believe we're all leaders, You all hear me say that every time, but we're, you know, if we as leaders walk this out and show that we can do it, then I think other people can relate to that. Um, So my last question on transformation is, you know, what's one area where you feel like our society may need the most adjustment um, to kind of get ourselves right the ship, if you will, from a spiritual standpoint, what's a good practical because I know it's easy to say, look, if we just all kind of get better at knowing who God is and walking out who he wants us to be, then maybe this will all start to change for the better. Well, that's, a, that's, that's true, but how do we get granular and strategic? What would you say to folks about how to help make that adjustment? Oh, man. Well, John, I, I think you, you, again, hit a great point of, from, from a leadership perspective, um, modeling is is the greatest way that that people learn so you're exactly dead on is uh, you know we should be seeking to walk these things out because the more we do it the more you're exactly right the more it's going to spread throughout um specifically um i think it goes back to the the thing that i'm going to be working on more so in 2021 it's listening to each other Mm -hmm. asking questions seeking to understand better we're coming out of this this 
crazy political season when it, it just seemed like all we were doing was yelling at each other and trying to get our, our viewpoints across. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot last couple of years, uh, you know, just listening um, to people around my life. And, and one of them is my, my brother-in-law, who's African-American. And uh, Chris is just an awesome guy, loves, loves Jesus. He's, he's a Christ follower. Um, he preaches, he's a lay minister. And so we've had some really deep conversations about, you know, Black Lives Matter and the, the, the whole racial reconciliation movement. And, and uh, you know, it, it's just been awesome to ask him questions about his life and his upbringing. What have been your experiences? And man, that has unlocked so much in our relationship of just understanding each other. Wow. And uh, of course, he's married to my sister. So I, I love him. And they've got a beautiful son named Ezra. And, you know, so I, I told Chris at the very beginning when we started talking about these things, I said, Chris, look, whatever we talk about will never change the way I feel about you. I, I love you as my, my brother, but I want to understand, you know, what, yeah. what this whole thing is about. And so we just started having those, those interactions of asking each other questions and talking through some situations. And, and uh, it's, it, it really did uh, cause me to, to, to understand him, to understand why people feel the way they do in, in certain situations and, uh, there's a much more of a sensitivity around some of those areas and subjects that we talked about, but it, it, it helped me. And so I, I learned just by asking questions and listening. So, so John, I think that, that really is from, from my perspective, just getting better at listening to each other, asking more questions. And I think that's a great trait of leaders. Leaders don't have to have all the answers, yeah. but we should be really good at asking the right questions. Wow. That's powerful. Like that is in a nutshell right there. Um, if you guys take one thing away, that's an, that's a great take is we don't have to have all the answers. I mean, I think I talked about that in my book some too, is to be, be humble enough to acknowledge we don't, you know, and, and defer if we need to defer, own what we need to own, but let's, let's try to get people around us that may balance out some of our, our weaker spots, you know, and, and not people that are just like us. Uh, you know, I think as a society, and this is just going to be my two second soapbox, but um, in regards to some of the the division that's out there, right? I, you know, I don't know where we got away from. We used to say opposites attract. You know, we used to say that in marriage class. You know, our wife or our spouse is not going to be just like us. And the quicker we understand that, the better. And And sometimes that's good. And so opposites attract, you know, that could go, that could cross so many different lines. It could cross socioeconomic, race, anything, gender lines. I mean, let's, let's get back to where maybe opposites attract, you know, because like you said, the more we acknowledge differences instead of expecting everybody to be the same. And if we're not, then let's just, you know, there's a line and you don't cross it. I don't cross it. And we'll agree to disagree. And we'll just, go on about our business, not liking each other. You know, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's something healthy about, okay, let's acknowledge that we are different. Let's acknowledge that we don't see it the same. Um, but let's listen, like you said, listen to each other. And, um, I think we can come to a common ground, especially, especially if we start with the foundation of faith as sort of the cornerstone of what brings us together in the first place. Yep. And, and that's kind of where I came up with this fuel, the faith unites exceptional leaders because faith can unite and can be the glue in so many situations that otherwise would just be uh, shambles, just be a grease fire. But, but if we can rally around, because I bet we'd be surprised those people that were hating on social media, you might, we might be surprised to know that we believe in the same God. That we, you know, what if we all believe in the same spirituality, but yet we're letting these other ancillary things divide us? So I don't know. Um, what's your take? You anything to add to that? Yeah, John, I would just say, <clears throat> let's get outside the church walls. Let's, let's, let's love the sinner. You know, that's, that to me, it, it's so easy to get caught up in our faith where we kind of start to self-isolate, you know, and, and uh, to me, that, that's just as dangerous. Um, you know, it, I think God's called us to go to the world and just kind of look back at scripture and see where Jesus yeah. hung out. You know, yeah. he had yeah. his disciples for sure. But when he was out in the, in the world, he was with sinners. And yeah. hey, that, that is, uh, that's the message of the gospel. And um, look, I've got, I've got black friends. I got gay friends. I've got friends who are, and, and guess what? 
they're all messed up just like me. And yeah. Uh, yeah. we're all looking for hope. We're all looking for, uh, for, for, in essence, we're looking for God. We're looking for yeah. that relationship. What does that look like? And, um, and that, that's where we need to come as, as believers is that uh, we are the, the ones that God plucked out of this mess of a world we live in. And we get to follow him and spend eternity with him. Yeah. And there's a world out there that needs to hear that message because, you know, there, there's a lot of hurting people. And if, if we can get out there and, and mix it up with them and love on them, that that's going to solve a lot of these issues, John. I really do believe that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if we can reflect it through, like you said, that grace, that love, that understanding, that kindness, um, I think that you get more what you get more with with honey than vinegar. Right. And so I think if we can just reflect the whole message of what Christ stood for um, instead of just telling and yelling it at people, if we can walk alongside people and show what it is. Um, as we segue kind of and close into where people can sort of find you or, or resources that you've provided that they can find, you wrote a book called More Than the Score. Is there anything else from that book that we could, that you can maybe add to close us out here that might be relevant to this whole message? Well, it's, um, you know, there, there's uh, some, some great topics. Uh, one, of the, one of the topics I start with, John, is just having the right perspective as a, as a parent, as a coach, you know, and the, the perspective of God has, has given you this, this blessing uh, mm. to, to nurture and to raise and to, and to teach. And uh, that's where I think our, our perspectives can get skewed if, if we go into – Sports, for example, your sons played baseball. You, you understand this. You lived through it. You know, when we start to get into that, that realm of, of trying to win and do anything it takes to win, you know, that's mm -hmm. when you start seeing behaviors get skewed and change. And it, it just takes away not only from the game, but it, it really damages uh, the kids. Mm -hmm. And we're just seeing this epidemic across the country with how, you know, parents and coaches are, are treating sports. You know, these are – these kids are precious gifts from God and, and we have the opportunity to speak into their lives and to grow them and to help them learn the life skills. that are going to last way beyond their time in sport. You know, mm. if 0.001% of kids in America ever get a chance to play professional sports, that that's wonderful for them. But what about the other 99 point, you know, 99% that yeah. aren't, um, what are they going to learn from the game? And that, that to me, that's the perspective of, uh, how can I be the greatest asset as a parent or a coach for those kids and that team and, and what God has entrusted to me, which is those lives of those kids. And um, I mean, I, more and more guys I talk to and I ask them about, <clears throat> you know, as you look back in your life, um, tell me about a relationship that, that meant a lot to you or mentor yeah. or teacher. And, and I bet probably 80% of the time it was a coach. Mm. It was a coach or a teacher that spoke, into their lives and challenged them and helped them to grow, uh, loved on them. But those are the people we remember. To me, that's the greatest legacy we can have, John, mm -hmm. is, that, is that God has called us in those positions of leadership and to take that responsibility serious enough to learn, you know, how can I be the, the greatest asset for, for this group of people that God's entrusted to me? Or if it's just your, your son or daughter that's involved, you know, and, and, um, and if they've got talent, great, help them develop that talent. But if they don't, let them enjoy the game. You know, just yeah. let them learn from what the game can teach us. And, uh, John, you know this. I mean, your son's learned so many incredible life skills and character things just from being around teams and learning how to be a great teammate, uh, learn how to play the game right, how to be respectful of officials. I mean, all those things are going to carry with them the rest of their lives. Absolutely. And, and they also, <clears throat> we, form <clears throat> we form some of who they become by how we react in those situations. Like you said earlier, <clears throat> you always your first conversation after an event would be a, a something positive, and so they're watching our reaction just as much as we're molding them to be the people through those experiences. Our actions and our words and what we do in those moments, uh, because some of the you know some of the times the parents are the worst in the in, in the equation um, in in those environments. But if we can you know walk that out and be the example, I think that forms them as well as people. Uh, guys, I, I hope you've enjoyed Pat. Thank you, uh, for this time together. Um, where can they get the book more than the score? Yeah, you can, uh, got a copy right here. You can order it online. <clears throat> so, um, Amazon, uh, Christianbook.com has it. 
Um, most major retailers online have it, but um, okay. yeah, I think we were, last time I looked, we were sold out of the hardback copies. We're getting those reprinted, okay. but the, certainly the softbacks are, are available. Yeah, it's only been a short time that it's been out, and um, man, what a what a great time Christmas gift uh, that could be for somebody. Because I know we all know a coach or or just a uh, a dad or a parent that that that, that could use that. Um, so you know, this personally, this has been an honor for me uh, to interview you. I mean, you you you've done so many things <clears throat> that that I respect and. Uh, in your life. And so I, I hope the listeners and I know the listeners have gotten just a, probably a page or so full of, of good takeaways from this, but what a great way to start off our December series uh, folks, uh, you, faith uniting exceptional leaders. And you just heard from an exceptional leader. Um, we talked about hope. We talked about encouragement, accountability, transformation. We turned up the heat a little bit. So in a cold month of December, we started this out really well, turning up the heat. So I hope you guys got something out of this. Till next time, be blessed.